Jesus the Word spoke to Moses. Interesting subject here. You can turn in your King James Bible to Romans chapter 9, verse 17. Romans 9, verse 17 says, For the Scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Now the interesting thing about this is, the Scriptures weren't actually even written at that point in time. They were given to Moses and, and things later, you know, as, as he was writing things down. But when God is speaking to Moses back there, we're going to go to Exodus chapter 9 here in just a minute. But when God is speaking to Moses, Moses hasn't written that stuff down yet. It's God speaking to Moses in Exodus 9. But here in Romans chapter 9 verse 17, it says, For the Scripture saith. Not, you know, the Scriptures say this. No, no, the Scripture saith. And it's God speaking. What's going on here? Well, I'm just going to give you a little spoiler as to what's going on. Um, Jesus Christ is the Word of God. And here in this passage, He's also referred to as the Scripture. You say, well, that's pretty interesting. Well, it's really interesting, though, when you understand the Godhead issue, because Jesus Christ is spoken of here as the Scripture saying to Moses, and yet back there in Exodus 9, it's the Father speaking to Moses. Do you think Jesus and the Father are one and the same being? Yeah. There's only one God, okay? Not two different gods. Not two separate persons. But it's funny because you have Romans chapter 9, and you go back to Exodus chapter 9. Turn there in your King James Bible. We'll go back to Exodus chapter 9. Interesting how the Lord planned that out. Same chapter. Exodus chapter 9. And we'll begin in verse 13. And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning, and stand before Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart, and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. For now I will stretch out my hand, that I may smite thee and thy people with pestilence, and thou shalt be cut off from the earth. And in very deed for this cause have I raised thee up, for to show in thee my power, and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. Okay, so there you have the verse that's being quoted in the New Testament. Verse 17, As yet exaltest thou thyself against my people, that thou wilt not let them go. Behold, tomorrow about this time I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such as hath not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof, even until now. Send therefore now and gather thy cattle and all that thou hast in the field, for upon every man and beast which shall be found in the field and shall not be brought home, the hail shall come down upon them and they shall die. Now look at this. I mean, I could have stopped there at verse uh, 16, but I read to this part here uh, for a very important reason. Verse 20. He that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the houses. And he that regardeth not the word of the Lord left his servants and his cattle in the field. Huh. So the uh, word of God has power and authority? Yeah, the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even though there were no written scriptures. Hmm, how about that? You say, well, what is this uh, written scripture thing? What is the word of God all about? Let's look about the seven references to the capital W word of God. Go to John chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to see the first three references here. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, again, you know, this, this pagan trinity nonsense of that there's three separate gods. There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're, all, they're three separate persons, but they're just one God. He say, oh, okay, so they're one God, so God the Father and God the Son are one and the same. No, they're separate. 
so there's two separate gods. No, they're just one God. Um, okay, if they're one God, then God the Father, God the Son would have to be the same. No, they're two separate persons. <laughs> they're two separate persons, but they're not two separate gods. Uh, no, there's just one God. Back there in Exodus chapter 9, the Lord wasn't saying to, to Pharaoh, now, you know, I'm the Father and I want you to have this message, you know, and, and actually I'm going to have it spoken through my son who is called in Romans chapter 9, who we called the Scripture, and he's also called the Word of God. And th there's a difference between the two. It's just God speaking. Okay? And it's not the Scripture, it's not written Scripture that spoke to Pharaoh. It's Jesus Christ, the Word of God. And in Romans chapter 9, verse 17, it says, The Scripture saith unto Pharaoh. So Jesus was there in the Old Testament speaking to Moses in the person of the Father? Yeah. That's what the Bible teaches. It's not heresy. It's Scripture. Do you have a problem with Scripture? Do you have to add to the Scripture, Trinitarians? The Bible is just not enough. You need to have the Trinity uh, terminology that was invented in the second century. You know that has to be there to to make the Scripture a little bit more clear. God didn't uh, God didn't quite get it right. He had to wait till uh, Tertullian came along to to invent some terms and things, and then the Catholic Church to kind of perfect it down through the centuries. And now we have it right. You blasphemous heretic! You. You said what'd you say? I said you're a blasphemous heretic if you're a Trinitarian. John chapter 1, verse 14. Here's the fourth reference to the Word. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Yeah. He comes down, He has to take on flesh, a body of flesh. How's He going to do that? Just, zoop, there He is. You say, well, yeah, okay, you just were, you just created yourself, God. I mean... This isn't fair. You, you don't know what it was like to be a baby. You don't know what, you know, he had to be born of a woman. That's what the scriptures prophesied. Well, then how could he come down and say, I'm born of a woman? And people would just say, well, then Joseph is your father. Mary even tried that one. She was embarrassed and, you know, thy father and I have salty sorrowing. You know, she tries to say Joseph, Joseph is the father to cover up, you know, for the fact that Joseph is not the father. And that gets him in trouble. You see? God has to come down and say, I'm the Son. My Father's in heaven. It doesn't mean that they're two separate persons. It's the flesh and the soul up there in heaven. And the Holy Ghost is the Spirit. It's right there. Not that hard to figure out. Hebrews chapter 4. I'll show you another one. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Okay. Can you say that about this King James Bible? Absolutely. This thing will judge anybody out there. Me judges you. Judges everybody. Judges everybody. But look at verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. You see, what's well, it's talking about the Lord or whatever. Well, yeah, it is. But the, in context, it's talking about the word of God. And it calls it his sight. His eyes. Hmm. How highly do you esteem this book? Is this book the most important possession that you have? Is this book the greatest thing on earth? Hmm. Very interesting. Next, we're going to go to 1 John chapter 1. We'll see the next reference to the Word. Capital W. Word of God. 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. 
That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled, of the Word of Life. The Word, capital W, talking about Jesus Christ. Did they handle him? Yeah, they did. They were there. They shook his hand. John, you know, had his, had his head on Jesus' chest there, on his breast at the Last Supper. Yeah, of course they handled him. They touched God manifest in the flesh. He was right there among them. He washed their feet. But notice it says that which was from the beginning. Jesus wasn't created. Okay? There wasn't a time when, you know, in the, in, the, in the eternity past, it was the Father and the Spirit, and Jesus was created later on. You get anybody that says that, they are a flaming heretic. And I say flaming because that's going to be their eternal state. They're going to be burning in flames. Look at verse 2. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. With the Father? Hmm. They're seeing Jesus Christ. Again, John chapter 14. Philip says to him, he says to Jesus, he says, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. And Jesus says, have I been so long time with you and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. It's just that simple. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus Christ is God, wholly and completely. Next, we'll go to 1 John 5, 7, the infamous Johannine comma that the uh, idiot scholars like to say. Um, it's, it's not in there and all this stuff. And you can, you can get into that whole debate. There's uh, early manuscript evidence and things, uh, or I shouldn't say early manuscript evidence, but there's early church father citations of 1 John 5, 7. It was around back there, you know, and uh, needs to be in the King James Bible. 1 John 5, verse 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And it's so funny because the Trinitarians, they get all excited about this and they say, See, see, three in heaven, and they're one in unity. Doesn't say that. They're one in essence. Doesn't say that. There's three and they're one. Okay? I am made up of three, body, soul, spirit, but I'm just one man. I'm not three separate persons. Man is created in God's image. It's just that simple. <laughs> okay? Really not that, that difficult. And by the way, if that's a great verse for Trinitarian doctrine, for this is the Trinitarian, you know, their strongest proof text is 1 John 5, 7, then why do the Catholic Trinitarians take it out of their Bibles? Because you see, it destroys the Trinity. There's three in heaven and they're just one. That destroys the Trinity. The Trinity says there's three and they're three. Three separate persons. You say the Father and the Son are one and the same being. They're one. No, 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 they're not. They're two separate beings. They're two separate persons. You know, all these little word games. Philosophy. That's what it is. And they'll spoil you through it. Let's look at the last reference to the Word of God. Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19, verse 11 through 13. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Either you believe the Bible or you don't. Either, either you believe that everything we need is right in here, or you believe that God uh, just kind of had a you know, senior moment or something like this, and he, he inspired the Bible, but he forgot to say Trinity. You know, and it had to be added later on. How high a position do you put this book in? Is this a discerner of the thoughts and intents of your heart? It is of mine. And I have to constantly check myself and say, am I in line with the book? I had a brother recently say, he said, brother, he said, uh, you know, you keep saying this thing of, oh, my word. 
And he said, word is one of the, na the names of Jesus. Are you taking the name of Jesus in vain? And I got to thinking about that and I said, boy, yeah, I, I got to be careful about that. But, you know, there are times when I will use that statement, oh my word, meaning I'm crying out to God. I'm just saying, oh, oh dear God, can you, oh my, you know, oh my Lord, oh my, oh my God, in terms of I'm calling out to him. I'm not using the name in vain. If I say, oh my word, I can't believe that they're saying this. It's like me saying, oh Lord, why are these people saying this? But, you know, it's, it's dangerous to do that because I, you know, sometimes I might be tempted to use it in, a, in an instance where I'm not referring to the Lord. So, okay. I receive correction from the brethren all the time. I get this thing put on me. Who are you accountable to? My brethren out there. And, you know, lost people as well. If they point out something, I made a mistake. You know, one of the big boo-boos I made was I was saying that Jim Jones's compound was in Africa. And the people are saying, no, it's South America. You know, it's Ghana versus Guyana. Uh, I messed that up. And people still, you know, I've, I've apologized for it, but it's still out there, you know. Then they are such an idiot because he, you know, said Jim Jones went to Africa instead of South America. I made a mistake. All right? But see, that's something my enemies pointed out, and I have to come back and correct it. There are other things my enemies have pointed out. There's other things the brethren have pointed out. And I'll correct myself. And that's what we're supposed to do as Christians. And I'll tell you right now, if you are a Trinitarian and you believe that Jesus Christ is fully, completely God, and you say, yeah, well, it makes sense, like, you know, Peter Ruckman was famous for this, he would teach the Godhead doctrine correctly, where he would say that, you know, it's the Father's the, the soul, the Holy Ghost is the spirit, Jesus is the body. It's right there. But then he'd switch and start using Trinitarian terminology. Um, that's a man that has been spoiled through philosophy, okay? And he needed to repent of that. Now, he's, he's dead, and I believe with the Lord right now. But the, the point is, there are a lot of people out there that are like him. And I've read, you know, different commentaries and things like that where they'll get the Godhead doctrine perfect, but then they'll throw in Trinitarian language, Trinitarian philosophy. Uh, that's a problem. And, you know, I'm not going to be too harsh on somebody like that if they get the doctrine of the Godhead correct, but then are spoiled through philosophy. Well, okay. But if you get somebody who's a militant Trinitarian and just adamantly says Jesus is not the Father, they're not, they're two separate persons, they're whatever else, you're dealing with a lost person. No question. You're dealing with somebody that can't accept the Word of God. And if you reject this book, you're rejecting Jesus Christ. I tell you right now. You say, oh, that's absurd. I can have a relationship with Jesus without the Bible. No, you can't. No, you can't. Um, you reject this book, the scripture, the word of God, you reject this book, um, you're lost. Just as simple as that. So that is going to be it. Uh, I pray you get straightened out on this whole issue of this Godhead versus Trinity thing. The Trinity is a wicked, satanic teaching. Um, it's going to damn a lot of people to hell. Um, because they're worshiping a false you know, set of gods, they're not even worshiping a false god. It's gods, plural. And a lot of the pagan ancient cultures had these multiple gods, three different gods, and they're all just one in unity and whatever else. It's satanic. And of course, the Antichrist, false prophet, and dragon in the future are going to literally be a physical trinity on the earth. He's going to sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. How's he going to do that? He's going to look like a trinity. He will be a trinity. They will be a trinity, I'll say it that way. Okay, very important subject. But again, another proof that Jesus Christ was there in the Old Testament as the scripture saith unto Pharaoh. And you go back there to Exodus 9 and it's God the Father speaking to Pharaoh. Hmm, very interesting. So that is going to be it. And we'll see you in the next video. Thank you for watching.